There we go. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Community Preservation Act Committee on November 30th, 2023. I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. We're meeting remotely via Zoom, which is permitted by the town and state. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and will appear on the town of Amherst CPA website uh, under the right-hand side under recordings. Uh, I'm going to call on people so that we can be sure that uh, we can hear you and you can be heard, committee members. So I'm Sam McLeod. Uh, Katie. Greetings, everyone. Uh, Michelle. Present, hi. Tim. <laughs> uh, present. Matt. Present. Doug. Present. Bob. Present. Robin. I'm here. Can you guys hear me or see me? We can hear you. Okay, good. Wonderful. And David Williams is not able to attend uh, tonight's meeting. He communicated to Holly and me previously. He's uh, out of town uh, and occupied with a conflict. We do need uh, someone to uh, take minutes for every meeting from our committee. Uh, does anyone wish to volunteer to do so for this meeting? Cue the Jeopardy music. <clears throat> Lewis, yeah. I see a hand from Katie. Katie, thank you so much. Uh, I'll do them next time, Sam, I promise. Uh, thank you, Bob. There's, sometimes there's a strategy as to when to choose to do the minutes. Some are more complicated than others. Uh, I see Katie nodding. <laughs> and Robin and Tim were aware of that as well. <clears throat> so... Um, <laughs> We have an agenda that's been posted and communicated to the town and on the town calendar. The first order of business on our agenda is to approve any outstanding minutes. Now we do have minutes from the meeting of November 16th uh, that were communicated to all in the packet and I had sent a couple of minor edits to Tim, uh, which had been incorporated. I'd like to open it up to the committee members in case anyone has any edits or comments on the minutes that they wish to communicate. Sam, I didn't get what you sent me, but if they're just minor, that's fine. Uh, they're minor, I had, uh, well, I believe I had edited, made the edits and sent them to you and or to Holly and CC'd you. We'll check on them. It was OK. Well, fine. that's fine. I, I, I have no problem. I just wanted to just make that clear. OK, uh, thank you. I'll double check uh, to make sure that I uh, didn't send it to an incorrect email address, which okay. is always a possibility. So thank you. Um, I'm not hearing or seeing any raised hands from committee members regarding the minutes. Um, the Sorry, I'm just looking at my draft. The only change I had was under public comment for the pickleball. I had Pat somebody or other, and I didn't have the last name. Maybe that's one of the edits you made. It was. Okay, great. great. Yeah, I edited the name of Pat and Okay. Immediately and after there was one other edit. I think the third edit that I didn't send to you was we started at 6.02 p.m. instead of 6.05, all minor. Um, okay. And so thank you for uh, sending the clear minutes to us. Um, if there's no additional comments from the committee members on these minutes, uh, would anyone like to make a motion? I will move to approve the minutes as amended. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of November 16th, 2023 as edited, as amended. Um, I'll proceed with a roll call vote uh, unless there's any discussion. 
not seeing any discussion. I will vote aye. Katie? I'm going to abstain since I wasn't present. Michelle? Aye. Tim? Aye. Matt? Aye. Doug? Um, aye. Bob? Aye. Robin? Aye. And David Williams is absent, so the motion passes uh, seven in favor, one abstention, and one absent. <clears throat> the next item on our agenda is public comment. We have a public comment section on every uh, meeting. Uh, we also are going to have a public hearing comment section uh, next week. Um, in, the, in the public comment, uh, community members are welcome to them, we, com communicate uh, or any statements they wish to make related to CPA in general uh, or anything that uh, relates to what we've been discussing in our meetings. I'd like to call on the attendees of this meeting to raise your hand, and I see one hand raised currently. Hold on. I'm sorry, Sam, if I could just interrupt for a second. Somebody has got some feedback and some background noise. Can somebody check their microphones? I'm hearing a lot of feedback on my end. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Polly. Uh, so again, uh, I'd like to uh, invite attendees and community members to uh, to participate with any public comment that they wish. Uh, I see a hand in the audience from Carlos Turiago. Uh, Holly, can you uh, bring Carlos into the meeting or have an, have an option for him to communicate with yes, us? Yes, hang on one sec. Um, there we go. I see his hand raised. His microphone is currently on mute. Um, so when you're uh, ready to speak, Carlos, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us and participating. Uh, we are here to listen to what you have to say. I think that was a technical mistake. Uh, I'm not planning to say anything yet. Okay. Thank you. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Yeah, there may be an option for you in your Zoom meeting to uh, lower your hand. Uh, it may yes. be a lower portion. It's yeah, yeah. Raised. But uh, so this, uh, thank you, Carlos. I yeah. guess uh, we can return Carlos to the uh, attendees list. Um, yeah. We have a number of audience members uh, who are listening to the meeting. And if any of the attendees wish to make a public comment at this time, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, you also have the ability to call in or <clears throat> I don't see the chat option here, although I think it exists. Um, if for some reason we miss somebody due to technical capacities uh, and you find a way to reach us at a later point in the meeting, I, I will uh, accommodate your, your wish to speak. I do see a hand raised here from uh, Pam Rooney, uh, Holly, can you bring Pam into the meeting? And uh... Hi, everybody. This is Pam Rooney speaking. Hi, I Pam. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for letting me join you. Um, I have not often been able to participate in your meetings, mostly because of the timing of them. Um, and I do not need to join as a panelist, that's fine. I just wanted to, to say thank you to everyone. I have been following uh, at a distance as your liaison to the town council, and I appreciate very much the time and consideration that goes into these decisions. I think the, the council looks forward every year uh, to these very in-depth and very thoughtful reports coming from this or this committee. Um, on, on how to spend uh, dollars that are in addition, obviously, to what we deal with in our operating budgets. It is such a treat to have 
this fund available to create really special opportunities in town that otherwise don't get addressed. So thank you. I'm not going to interfere with your process here. Just want to uh, appreciate your contribution. Uh, thank you, Pam, uh, for making your comments today and also for your uh, ongoing availability as our liaison. I appreciate it. I know uh, you and other council members are extremely busy, uh, but uh, thank you for your comments. And of course, uh, anytime there's a desire to say something, you're quite welcome to join us in the uh, meeting. <clears throat> um, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to make a comment? Please raise your hand if you wish to. I do not see any raised hands. I'll wait a minute. Uh, last meeting, it took a little while for a few uh, community members to gain access to the meeting. We certainly I, want to I give could, anyone who wishes the opportunity to speak. I could probably be removed from the from the display here. Uh, Holly, are you able to accomplish that? Yep, I'll set. So the first presentation is for 615 with the Amherst Historical Society. So yep. I'm going to. We'll end the we'll end the uh, public comment section. Thank you for those who participated. And Amherst Historical Thought Society is presenting regarding the accessibility and existing conditions study. Uh, is let's see who's in the audience. The application was submitted by a group, including Gigi Barnhill. Yes. Um, I see Simeon Strong. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> uh, welcome. And I see uh, Aileen Tierney, if I pronounced that correctly, in the audience. Correct. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, we and maybe it, Liz Larson may be there as well. I'm not seeing Liz Larson no. at present. Well, uh, she'll be along. I but if, assuming she joins, uh, we keep an eye out for that. And I welcome your um, presentation. We're we're listening. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. And I would just uh, like to echo Pam Rooney's expression of gratitude. Um, I too thank you for all of the time you devote to the work of this committee, which I know is enormous and it is essential, really, to the qualities that make us all proud to call Amherst home. Tonight, I want to give you some background on the proposal of the Amherst Historical Society to CPAC. Beginning in 2019, the Historical Society took time to undertake some strategic planning through a program offered by the American Association for State and Local History, uh, known as STEPS. Uh, the full title is Standards and Excellence Program for History Organizations. The trustees went through this rather involved process and um, fulfilled requirements for most of their most of their program. What we did not accomplish, though, was the uh, fourth goal, which concerns the stewardship of historic structures and landscapes. Um, we truly need a Full, fully professional and careful analysis of the building uh, to make sure that it's around for another century or more. Uh, we began to attack this objective thanks to the CPA grant of fiscal year 2023, which engaged Jacob Smith, an engineer in South Deerfield, to provide a visual assessment of the structure with particular attention paid to the impending deconstruction of the 1990 addition to the Jones Library and then the new construction, which is anticipated. Jacob Smith's report provides important information, which we'll get to in a moment. However, another part of this objective of the STEPS program is to increase accessibility so that all visitors can get inside the building to enjoy its cultural offerings. This goal has eluded us. Uh, the trustees all know that we need to have an accessible entrance, but it's not so easy. And 
we really do need um, professional help on this. And it does impact uh, the organization quite significantly because uh, accessibility is key when applying for programming grants from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. When I tried to apply for a grant some years ago, I failed the first question, is your building accessible? And once you fail that question, you can't get into the system. Um, and a final part of the step objective is improving storage conditions for the collection. And we have some 7,000 artifacts housed in the building at 67 Amity Street. And uh, we need to study uh, HVAC issues and the potential use of heat pumps to heat more of heat the building. The trustees of the Historical Society include your fellow residents who bring many talents and skills to the table. However, when it comes to the examination of a structure as important to the town's identity and history as the Historical Society does, we frankly need professional assistance. Therefore, the trustees turned to Kuhn Riddle Architects who assembled this proposal with our input that will help the trustees establish priorities for work that must be done in an orderly fashion. Without the report that will follow the analysis of the structure and its various parts, including such aspects as wiring, plumbing, the foundation, sills, and roof, the organization will have to respond to emergencies in a piecemeal fashion. And frankly, we don't have the money to <laughs> operate in a piecemeal fashion. Um, these uh, most of these efforts are quite expensive and beyond our uh, normal budget. And furthermore, the regulations that pertain to historic structures, such as the Amherst Historical Society, are detailed. And again, professional assistance is key to the longtime survival of the Historical Society's museum. With the fiscal year 2023 Jacob Smith report in hand, and I hope you've all taken a look at it, um, is a term that appears several times in the report. And that term is structurally deficient. And that, that term is uh, a little scary when you're looking at a, a tall building. The roof requires new reinforcing supports. Leaks need to be repaired. A new roof consistent with the building uh, is required to say the least. Also recommended is replacing portions of the sill beam. It's also important to note that the building is no longer plumb. That is, the building leans to the west. This situation probably cannot be remedied without damaging the interior, but an accurate assessment needs to be made. The work of my BIM team, um, which is part of our proposal to CPAC, is important to the surveillance of this condition. There is also work to be done in the area between the two additions on the north side of the building. Jacob Smith concurs that documenting pres present conditions is critical to the future of the building and to an orderly uh, work on the structure. The work of the team assembled by Kuhn Riddle will also address infrastructure issues. In particular, a mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection survey will be undertaken. We are eager to have recommendations relating to heating and air conditioning. In short, this proposal, large as it is, will provide the Historical Society with solid proposals for needed work along with designs and estimates. I should add that we are in the process of preparing a grant proposal to the Massachusetts Cultural Council's Cultural Facilities Fund, and we'll ask for uh, somewhere between 30 and $35,000, which is the maximum grant, uh, which can be matched buy a grant uh, from the town through CPAC. We can match Mass Cultural Council funds with municipal funds. Anyway, I'm happy to report that Aylan Tierney of Coon Riddle is with us um, this evening to help me answer any questions you may have, but that ends my formal introduction to our proposal. It's in information that really wasn't in the proposal itself, so I hope it's been helpful. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I just want you to know if you hadn't seen that Liz Larson has been admitted to the meeting as well. Oh, okay, good. So if you had wished for additional comments from anyone before the
committee speaks, uh, uh, you're welcome to. Um, Liz, do you or Aylin want to say anything at this point? Um, I have no additional comments to what Gigi just uh, told the committee. Okay, that was Liz. And this is Elon Tierney, um, president at Kuhn Riddle Architects. Um, and I, I also have nothing else to add other than we are also a neighbor um, to the museum and um, very much appreciate this building from a historical perspective. Great, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Liz and Aylin. Uh Gigi, I, I saw the name Simeon Strong on the display. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wondering about that. Uh, so I'm glad that Liz referenced your name. Uh, I recall your presentation last year with the paintings. Right. Um, uh, welcome to all of you. And thank you for uh, taking the time to present and comment on your presentation. I'd like to open the floor to committee members uh, who wish to make any comments or questions. Uh, Tim, your hand has been up for some time. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, call on you earlier. Uh, I had already started to engage with the presenters, but uh, uh, anything you'd like to say, Tim? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to have a uh, conflict of interest comment that I am a former trustee of the Simeon Saw Strong Historical Society Museum. Uh, I can't remember the years, but I was a trustee for about two or three years. Oh, I don't know eight years ago or seven years ago, whatever it was. So that will that comment will also be applicable when we get into our de deliberation phase. Uh, thank you, Tim. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Tim, Tim, I think you got off the board about the time I came on. I, re I remember mm -hmm. seeing your name on old minutes. Yeah, I worked uh, with Phil Shaver when he was uh, president. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, any committee members with questions or comments? I see Matt, your hand is up. Oh, hello. Um, thank you for your proposal. So this looks like what you're trying to do is basically move toward a sort of conceptual design for a whole bunch of work that you sort of expect is going to happen or need to happen. Um, how, how do you think that is that work, which is, I don't know, obviously going to be a lot of money. How, how is that? How are you going to fund that? Where is where are you expecting to receive money for that? Um, I think that uh some some projects will probably come back to CPAC at some point, not all at once, but there also is the uh, cultural council's um facilities fund, which we can apply to, and we can match their money with money locally raised. So. Um, that will be our expectation. And I think we're, um, we haven't had any major fundraising initiatives for quite some time. Certainly I've only been in town for a decade, but, um, I think, you know, we'll just have to really get out there and do some hard work and raise some money locally. So, um, so I guess your feeling is that this is sort of a backlog of, of, I don't know, 10 or 20 years or more worth of worth <laughs> of work. <laughs> okay. And, and and you don't anticipate doing this. You, you you the actual construction you think will be in multiple phases? Oh, absolutely. It's more okay. than we can undertake at any one time. Um, and this is Liz Larson. I would also like to add that with a study, a professional study such as this, we will also be able to look seriously at federal level grants, uh, which will require um, a lot more uh, input from, from the architects and planning. Uh, right. Right. Okay. That, I, I, I'm starting to understand what's going on here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and probably some of the um, projects that need to be done will be quite small. Okay. And I mean, replacing a sill is sounds horrible, but actually, given the fact we don't have a whole lot of plumbing pipes, it's it's not the major thing it would be in a 20th century house or right. Victorian period house. I, It's going to be... I, 
we don't know what we're going to find at this point. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. I think this is a long journey again, just um, part of the study is determining what the priorities are. What are the things that need to be addressed immediately? And what are the, creating a timeline um, for the Amherst Historical Society of how they could approach the projects and then they can use that information to go after grants if it's repairs or renovations or additions for accessibility. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robin, I see that your hand is up. You're on mute at present. Hi there. I know I'm here. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, the because I'm driving some of the um, information that uh, Matt asked a question about dropped out. But um, I just wanted to say that I'm really pleased to hear that um, the um, Circle Society is applying to the Mass um, Cultural Council for uh, grant funding for these um, these studies, which are clearly very important. And um, I wanted to remind um, them about the Massachusetts Preservation Project Fund, which is through Massachusetts Historical Commission. I was looking at it today. It does look like nonprofits can apply for um, free project planning funds, and their yes. deadline is until um, March, uh, full disclosure, I, I just started a job at the Massachusetts Historical Commission, but I'm not in um, the planning fund department. So um, feel free to reach out to them. If you should have trouble getting uh, through, you can contact um, somebody else on my commission to see if they can help you kind of make a connection there. But I also wanted to um, um, stress how critical this uh, these um, Reports will be for future funding uh, and, and Mass Cultural Council, both Mass Cultural Council and um, Massachusetts Preservation Project Funds could be um, sources for future funding. Um, so it would be great to see this project be one of the first two um, in the field of historic preservation really uh, be able to take those CPA dollars and um, transfer them into funding outside of just the local town fund to make important improvements uh, to building. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Uh, that's certainly some worthwhile information that I hope the uh, applicants <clears throat> are aware of. And if not, uh, if for any reason, you can contact the committee to get a hold of Robin or um, also look on the historic commission for the town of Amherst. I, I already have information about the historical okay. commission funding and it came from, um, I think it came from you, Sam, or maybe from Holly, but um, I have it on my desk, my messy okay. desk. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Um, Doug. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks Gigi for the presentation. I'm just wondering, um, you know, this may go be a question for Elon, and it may be premature, but is is the building considered what's called a house museum uh, from a building code point of view, or is it is it actually a public museum, which would be subject to some of the Mass Access Board thresholds for full accessibility? That's a great question, Doug, and um, we haven't done a code review yet, but that would be part of this study is to determine what category it fell into. I believe it is technically called a house museum right now. Yes. And there are, in, in the accessibility code, there are um, exceptions for historical structures. So we did a similar study for the Jones Library and went through and said which items are required, which items they may want to do just because it provides accessibility and which items um, may not be required and could go through a variance process because it's a historic structure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Robin, your hand is still up. Do you, did you re-raise it? Do you have an additional comment or question? No, can you ignore me until I get out of my car? 
Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, any other questions from committee members? Uh, I have a question uh, for whoever wishes to respond from the applicants. Uh, I'm curious if there are any immediately known needs, that is to say, some that are relatively urgent uh, and associated with that. Um, have, have you received any comments or even estimates or just uh, from any contractors who might have an idea how to address the most urgent needs distinct from the accessibility study? Uh, in other words, are there holes uh, somewhere that need to get filled? Is there uh, uh, stairs that are uh, uh, hazardous, et cetera? Are there any urgent ones that you're cognizant of that we may I, not be familiar I, with? I think there are a couple of um, areas that Jacob Smith in his uh, report that you all got copies of, uh, he, he mentions, um, some of the sill work that may need to be replaced, but also between the two wings on the north side of the house, there's a, an old chimney that's there. Uh, I guess it services the furnace, so it's still in use, but there's apparently some leakage back there that, um, you know, the building's not gonna fall down. He didn't find anything that was dangerous um, or hazardous um, in the current conditions. But, you know, that would be one thing that should get looked at sooner than later. Um, and the structure up in the attic is structurally deficient. There, that's where that term comes in. And, um, but he doesn't, he didn't think that was an immediate need, but, you know, if we were to have the 1838 hurricane come through now, you know, this many years after that, it might, we might have some trouble. Okay. If, if I could, if I could just chime in a little bit, um, sure. Jacob Smith did the uh, evaluation of existing conditions for the structure. So he went in and looked at everything and found where the areas were deficient or that needed repair. The next step, which is included in this proposed study, is to identify how to make those repairs and determine the cost for those repairs. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I guess as a follow-up, just to confirm my understanding, uh, when Matt had asked uh, the nature of the study, uh, you explained uh, to my benefit and possibly to other committee members that the study could be used as a uh, uh, a contribute uh, a contributing asset for other applications. Uh, is it fair to say that the that's the main purpose of the application to generate the thorough study that can be used uh, beyond uh, the town as opposed to urgent repairs? Oh, absolutely. This is probably a, a blueprint for the next five to 10 years. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's going to take a while. And uh, just knowing, knowing what the, wasn't there an estimate of like $120,000 to repair one of the church steeples that came before you within the last few years? We've had a few uh, estimates. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can, I can amount. imagine I can kind of imagine our own roof needing that kind of support. And we can't do that every year. I mean, you can't do that every year. That's and um, we, as, as was the case last year, we have uh, a higher level of requests than we have available funds. Uh, last year, we were able to find a way with support from the town to uh, navigate that. Uh, are there any portions of the study that might be uh, less immediate? yet could still be completed in a phased process? Well, we're at an interesting intersection with the Jones Library. Um, it may be that the, there's a $6,000 line for the My BIM team study. And it may be that the library will fund that because it's sort of a requirement 
before they start causing vibrations coming our way. So we might be able to take that out. Um, but that's the only element I know that we can completely take away. I mean, we could put off the engineering part, the engineering study. I mean, if you look at the I, I can I jump in, Gigi, sure, just sure. to um I so when we look at an existing condition a building existing condition study, um, we really do like to look at it holistically because if there are repairs that need to be made to the mechanical systems, it might impact the structural system or the architectural finishes. When you start picking apart an existing condition study, um it ends up being, well, not complete and comprehensive and potentially in the long haul costing the entity more um, to make repairs. Doing this upfront study allows us to figure out how to approach things in the order of priority, uh, both for the, the, you know, the structure, but also the Amherst Historical Society. So it, it, I like to think of buildings as bodies. Um, and hopefully when you know you go to the doctor, they look at you as a whole person. And when we go out to buildings, we look at it as a whole building. Uh, thank you. Um, that answers my question. Uh, any other questions from committee members? So I, I'd like to thank you for presenting and for responding to our questions if we have Additional uh, questions, we'll be sure to uh, reach out to you. Okay. Um, and you've been through the process previously, at least Gigi has, and we're following a similar, similar pattern this time. Uh, our next meeting would be December 7th, which is a public hearing where we'll later in the meeting commence with our discussions. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And Holly, if you're able to uh, remove the existing applicants and bring in the Zion Church folks. Okay, hang on, I'm working on it. Um, so... Sam? Yes. Well, this this is Tim, while you, she's pulling that up. Uh, in the uh, agenda, the dollar amount was not included. I'm going to assume when these applicants uh, make their comments that there's no change in the dollars, right? Uh, so I'm operating under the assumption that the numbers we've gotten up to this point are the correct numbers. That's probably true. I've not heard of any changes to the requested amounts. Okay. Um, if we hear any, or if I receive anything, certainly the committee would uh, be informed of that. Uh, that's a good assumption. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do see uh, Seek Young in the uh, panel. So um, is, is there anyone else that they would like me to bring in? Can you hear us, Seek Young? Yes, I could. Uh, welcome. Uh, is thank there you. Anyone in addition you would like to uh, have join you in your presentation? No, not today's meeting. I'm the only one who's here. Okay. So we're here to listen to what you would like to say. Uh, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. I think what, what I'd like to discuss is a follow-up with the uh, attend the uh, CPA request the uh, asked to attend meeting, historical meeting on November 13, uh, discuss and seek the guideline of uh, roof materials. So I have, I have attended the historical commission meeting on November 13, have discussed it. And I was told they will give us decision next Monday. So they asked me to attend meeting again on December 4th on Monday evening. Um, okay, uh, that's good to hear that you're in communication with the Historical Commission. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have a, uh, a, the chair of the uh, commission is a 
member of our committee, uh, although I'm not sure, uh, Robin, if you're available to hear us or not. Um, I know you wanted us to wait until you're out of the car, although this inquiry is uh, pertinent to your uh, area. Can you hear me and do you have any- I can hear you, yeah, I'm sorry. To what uh, Sik Young said about joining you on the next meeting, is that correct? Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, I'm sorry, my phone is for some reason, I'm not driving anymore and the Zoom is stuck in driving mode. Um, so I'm just having a little hard time managing that. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, the issue with the roof material is not uh, something that we need to be particularly concerned about. It's just a question about a historical precedent, which I think they addressed in some of their application materials. So, um, but we always like to have our, I would love to have our um, CPA applicants come to the um, historical commission meetings to talk about their projects. So um, that's basically the gist of it. Okay, uh, that's good to know. Uh, so Seek Young, uh, Robin has acknowledged what your comment was. Is there any uh, anything else you'd like to communicate to us uh, in your presentation slot regarding your proposal? No, because uh, CPA told us on meeting that we attend on this, uh, September, told us that we submit our application. We have a uh, reason I submit all the materials from very beginning that when we started two years ago, in case you lost the material and, you know, just uh, mm -hmm. sending it what we have discussed, got a new estimate and which is 177, 9, 11. That was the scope of a work I have submitted to CPA in the, the September. That reason all the materials went in again, because case you overlook something or because it has been two years. So case you need it, that's why I send it all the estimate. We got it from day one, we started this historical uh, preservation uh, application. So uh, we are still sticking with the uh, September estimate we have uh, submitted, which is $177,911. Uh, and, but I don't know that we consider our application was uh, rejected. Uh, that's why you told us to submit again, which we have. But it's Question is remain is still whether it's a slate roof material or that we could have what that asked for single. Uh, slave roof is prices that really uh, uh, is enormous. We have a two estimate from a slave. Uh, that's what they do is just install slave roof. One of them we got is a $350,000. That is the replacing whole roof. But we, I asked them again, very recently, after attending a November meeting with the historical commission, is it possible they could do the just area where need to be replaced? And I got to respond back, say they don't do the partial work, either whole roof or nothing. Then other second person we had an estimate is uh, their uh, professionalizing only slave roof. But this person who's in charge, he's not taking any more work. He gave us estimate uh, October of 2022. After he finished his last work, he's planning on retiring. So two slave roof we got estimate is one of them is 315, other one companies that he's no longer taking new work. So I don't know where we are in a, up in the air, uh, hoping for decision from CPA and historical commission, whether uh, will allow us to go with the S for single or have to be go with a slave. And so we are on the air just as you are, so. Uh Thank you, Sikyong. I do see that 
Robin has her hand up. Uh, Robin, is there something you'd like to say regarding uh, the comment from Seek Young? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, our meeting is coming up next week and um, I will make sure that we have, I, I think that it didn't make the official agenda, but unanticipated items is always um, a part of our agenda. And I will make sure that we have a formal statement from the Historical Commission next week on uh, the approval of uh, of, a, of the roofing material. And um, I, I mean, I can add that um, it's true that roofs are, are incredibly expensive and I'm learning more and more about um, exceptions to anywhere um, they need to be replaced. So um, I don't anticipate that it's a problem, but we will make sure that we have something official um, next week so that we can move forward without further question. Can you confirm for me, Robin, what day it is next week that you would be meeting? I believe it is Monday. Okay. I should is know, but <laughs> it would be before um, our next CPA meeting. I think so. Yeah, but actually, I'm not. This, I know um, Nate was trying to to post the agenda today, so I think it's Monday. I'm sorry, my my. I'm just not having a great time with my okay. phone here. I can't confirm. Well, um, if you could let us know when. Yep. Uh, there, because you know, next week's the public. Oh wait, here it is. No, I was looking at the wrong week. Yes, it is Monday. Monday is Wonderful. Uh, thank okay. you, thank you <laughs> sure. for informing us uh, of that. So, Seek Young, hopefully you heard Robin's comments. Um, yeah. What I heard was that she believes, although they'll have a formal statement in meeting, they she indicated that it seems that the material on the roof is not apt to be a problem. Uh, so um, would you like to comment further or, or uh, I can open up to questions from committee members if you're, uh, if, if you're done with what you'd like to say? Well, I just, uh, at the meeting on, on November 13, Robin and May uh, made a comment I don't want to say anything to be official on after I will attending December 4th Monday meeting. They yeah. told me they will uh, notify me. I mean, I'm going to attend meeting, so they're going to let me know their decision next Monday. That's why I'm very optimistic, but I don't want to share that with you yet until yeah. so I hear this uh, final wording. Okay. So. Well, thank you. Um, I guess if there's, I, I guess I can open it up for the committee uh, to ask any questions or any comments that they have or wish to make. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. For Seek Young. I, Matt, I see that your hand is up. Yes. So, Seek Young, thank you for yes. your uh, diligence in uh, working through this proposal. Um, uh, I guess I have a couple of questions relating to the um, the written questions. Okay. Um, so you, and, and they're just really just clarification of things okay. I think you've already said. Um, mm -hmm. So you're, you're comfortable with the, the estimates and no contingency? Yeah, we do have, that's, Sam asked us, uh, or CPA asked us to send me the email with a contingency plan. And we wrote down uh, what we contingency plans are. Of course, being a nonprofit organization, we're strictly relied on a uh, congregation contribution. And if that doesn't meet the contingency plan, we are willing to go to bank. And I went to bank already and spoke with the uh, uh, vice president of uh, business lending. So uh, they are asked us, assure us that give us a uh, loan, the amount we need. Hopefully it's not big amount, but uh, they're, we are insured to they give us a loan. Okay. And then um, just a little clarification on the, um, the historical preservation uh, it's described as an easement in the question. I guess it's sort of like a, uh, uh, um, so 
what we have been saying is that for all of these historical proposals coming through CPA that we're expecting um, them to put uh, the town and, and them to work together to put together a uh, uh, historical preservation, I forget the, the, the name of it, the um, restriction, restriction, historical preservation restriction on on the property so yes. um yeah so you're prepared to do that and then I, maybe we need to add in in other projects we've added five thousand dollars to the project in order to do that because we i think uh, uh that dave and they we had a meeting back in february and they explained to us they explained to us what happened if we accept the grant from cpa and, okay. But, so we understood. Okay, good. Um, Thank done. you. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask a follow-up question about the proposal from uh, Matt Cor Corcoran that yes. uh, seems to be the basis for the request. Yes. Uh, it's dated on in August 10th. Yes. And we're now at the beginning almost of December. Mm -hmm. um, I assume that the roofing season has passed yep. so that this work would be most likely happening in the spring or summer of 2024. And so the question is uh, whether this proposal amount that's been stated here is still going to be valid in another four or five months or whether inflation and, uh, you know, is going to cause that contractor to say, well, you know, that was my price back in August of mm -hmm. last year. What my price now is higher. One of the things I was going to do is talk to a uh, roofer, Shumway Service. They give us estimate of uh, almost $69,000. And so I didn't have a chance to go over with them to tell them that, that we have to resubmit the application. And so this work not going to be done to sometime next year, maybe following year. So I am I am going to follow up with the Shumway roof, Roofing Service, and also with the uh, uh, Matt Cochran as well, because he did all the uh, estimate from staging set up uh, this miners work and carpentry work. So far as the macro current, I don't think the price is his labor and his man is not changing. My uh, our church main concern is the roof estimate of uh, almost sixty nine thousand dollar. That assuming that price if is for if uh, historical commission and CPA will allow us to do the ash for shingle. If it's uh, none other than ash for shingle that have the price will be changed tremendously. So at this point, I cannot give you a definite answer. We're gonna stay with $177,000. Uh, I'm gonna do work diligently more and speak with the roofers and explain the current situation. Anything changes other than we have a cement already over 177 Nine eleven thousand dollars. I will email the Sam, uh, so you guys were aware of it. What's going on? Any changes? Hopefully, I know with the inflation will change some. Hopefully, not too much. So, I will give you an update after I talk to them. So, um, the way you described that um, makes me. Uh, it seems that it variants with the, the proposal from Mr. Corcoran, his proposal includes work from Shumway. So yes. your contract would be with Mr. Corcoran, correct? Yes. And you're yes. not going to be contracting with Shumway. No, I am going, because I don't know, some of you are not aware or not, uh, Matt Corcoran have a personal, uh, not the problem, but I don't want to review anything. But uh, I am going to do get in touch with the Shumway Roofing Service myself, and I will talk to Matt uh, sometime next next week. I don't want to bother him this week. So, okay. Thank and you. anything changes, uh, of course, naturally, I'm going to email this 
emailed to Sam. And so you are all aware of it, what's going on. I wish I could give you 100%, this is what it is. But because not knowing it's going to be sleigh roof or ash for single, so we are kind of in a limb as well. Uh, follow up, Doug, or are you? So, uh, Sikyong, having heard yes. the questions, uh, I had a similar question to Doug's, uh, which is uh, operate that I and our committee will operate on the assumption mm -hmm. that the hundred and seventy-seven thousand. Uh, from the uh, update that you provided in September yes. is the basis for your current request. Yes. Uh, Matt uh, on our committee had referenced that we sometimes allocate funds mm -hmm. for historic preservation restrictions. Yes. Uh, and distinct from that, I, Doug was inquiring about the likelihood of that estimate uh, being accurate. And I understand that you can't state with it with certainty what might occur. But the, the point that Doug brought up that I thought was um, important is that if I understand correctly, and if I believe our committee understands correctly, your intent is to work with the general contractor, Matt Corcoran. Yes. Uh, and that he will be the uh, contractor that will oversee the project and the payments and yes. other things affiliated with it. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing from my perspective is I've heard a few comments from our uh, historical commission representative, Robin, that there's a good possibility that your request for the use of some form of asphalt or equivalent material yes. is quite you know, it, it is a potential. Yes. Uh, and if, if we assume that that is viable, that material, mm -hmm. then our questions related to your estimate are valid. So I, I guess what I would say is this. Okay. Uh, I think it be, would be beneficial for you to have a conversation with the general contractor uh, prior to our committee engaging in our commencement of deliberations. Okay. Uh, we certainly can receive information at a subsequent time, uh, but we're apt to commence discussions and any any new information or any changes that you identify, uh, it's beneficial for all, including you as the applicant to inform our committee. Okay. Uh, but we'll, I will assume that the application as presented and the estimate from uh, the general contractor of 177 is what we're discussing here. Yes. Uh, so sure. thank you. Uh, Tim. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I just wanted to confirm the question I asked for the written responses about both the Kuhn Riddle and the GNCB consulting expenses to get to this point. Uh, and the way I understood it, the church is going to assume all those costs and that the 177 proposal is just to do the work. All that preliminary cost is being assumed by the church and that's not a part of this request. Is that a fair assumption of your proposal? Yes, here? because we didn't have a choice in the matter. We are assuming that design work will be a part of the grant will be included, but since our application was postponed, uh, that Kuhn and Riddle, they, they didn't want to wait payment uh, too long. So I told them what's going on. Our application was postponed. So we asked them if they could take a monthly installment, they agree. So we are making a monthly payment. So that won't be, uh, Grant will be the pain of Korean and Riddle. So our church will be responsible. And and I'd like to add for anyone who might be unaware, uh, our funds cannot be used for work that's already been completed. So um, it's good to hear that you're aware of that. And thank you, Tim, for asking that question. Uh, Bob. 
Um, sure. Uh, when when we discussed this in September, I there was either a revelation or some question about whether the water was coming down inside the building or outside the building. Ha has that been confirmed that this is water that's leaking outside the building and not inside? And I'm just only concerned that there might be additional damage that we're not taking into consideration here? Is both. Very first, that when I had a, a general contractor came out, look at our roof. He noticed he went up in a roof. He saw roof was a dented where light coming out. That means a hole in there. That's when we called the architect and got involved with the structural engineer as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, what Matt Cochran said on September meeting that water is from gutter being rusted, water coming down is going through the basement directly. That's true. And we had a damage in a basement. We fixed it, hopefully. But the root problem is still existing in my opinion. I'm not a contractor, but I read and I talked to all the contractors who came to our church. And as you, everybody saw, uh, Chris Foley is the architect who did a work and went up on the roof and structural engineers. They say it is not a, a hole in there, need to fix. That's why when Chris Foley attended the meeting, he issued that uh, this is an emergency, the roofing should be fixed this passing uh, winter. So we were in the year already. So I didn't say anything last meeting because I expect Matt Cochran opinion, Willis, uh, our architect. So that's why our application was postponed and we are hoping that we could get approved for this uh, grant to fix the roof. So uh, I didn't go up myself, so I don't know really, but I'm just taking a professional opinion estimate. So it is a problem in and out. So, uh, thank you, Seek Young. Thanks. Yeah. If I'm hearing, I'm not certain uh, that what you're saying is exactly what Matt had said at the last meeting uh, in September. I, you did indicate that you're not a contractor or an expert. Um, in September, my recollection, which is fairly clear, is that Matt made it, Matt Corcoran was very clear in his statement that the uh, damage was not occurring inside the building, that the water was flowing externally. Um, that was repeated multiple times. I recommend that you touch base with him again. And if there's any change to let us know, uh, oh, yeah. our understanding, I won't speak for my understanding, my mm -hmm. understanding as a committee member is that, um, regardless of whether there's an immediate leak or not, that the nature of repairing the entire roof under the assumption of the existing $177,000 estimate, yes, that could not take place until at the earliest next spring anyway. Okay. So regardless, what I heard with clarity at the last meeting was that regardless of the status of where the water is going, mm -hmm. that there's there was not the capacity under the estimate that's been provided for the work to commence prior to April of next year at the earliest because of the drying times of the beams. So okay. my suggestion is uh, if there's anything different, feel free to let us know relating to the estimate. Okay. Uh, and it, it may be beneficial, beneficial to hear if there's any change Okay. In commentaries from Matt, but uh, uh, I guess that's all I have to say. Uh, yeah. Does anyone else on the committee here have any questions or comments for Sikyong? Well, Sikyong, I'd like to thank you for your persistence in attending the varying meetings yeah. and your patience as you seek to navigate 
the uh, process of interacting with the town as well as with contractors. Uh, it's good to hear you. I'm sorry we're not seeing you. Um, but we will, if we have any additional questions for you, uh, we will communicate them to you via email. Uh, and if if you wish to review anything from the meeting on September 14th, mm -hmm. you were in attendance and it's not always easy to hear everything that's going on when you're in the middle of a meeting. We do have a video link on the town website or I, and I could even email to you if you wish, if you wish to see the meeting again, to see what was communicated by uh, Matt Corcoran uh, at that time. So um, I'd like to thank you for your time and for joining us and for your information. Well, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for trying to help us restore our church and yep. trying to provide a grant and we appreciate that. And thank, thank you, everybody. Good night. Um, so uh, we're running a bit over time here. We don't want to curtail the opportunities for our presenters to respond to important questions. So those of you who are scheduled for uh, a time that's already passed, we will grant you your time. And I apologize for uh, not holding to the exact um, schedule. Uh, so the next applicant is the District 1 Neighborhood Association. I do see that uh, Meg Gage is in the audience. Yes, and thank you so much, Sam. And there are th three other members of our committee here, Catherine Stryker, Jane Wald, and Hetty Startup, who will also participate. And Brian Harvey, unfortunately, I think had to leave but um, they're members of our committee. Well, welcome you, welcome uh, Meg and uh, your colleagues. This is the District One Neighborhood Association regarding the Mill River History Trail project. Uh, thank you for joining us and we're, we're glad to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. I'll make uh, some brief comments and invite questions so that we're sure that what we say relates to what you're most curious to hear. We're very happy to have this opportunity to talk with all of you about our proposal for stage two of the Mill River History Trail project. That's a working title. Uh, I'm not sure what our final name will be. Stage one was funded by the CPA Committee for archeological and archival research to look at four sites for which there was physical evidence. And I hope you've had a chance to either read or at least look through the report it's um, pretty embarrassing how much work they did for $12,900. Um, but I think the team that did that were into it and we're very proud of the quality of the work. Um, stage two will expand the project to look at nine specific sites and three contextual or historical features that aren't related to a specific place, but are about things that were going on in North, North Amherst and particularly around the river. These sites will not involve, involve archaeology, but instead will be more archival. There's a massive amount of material in people's basements and letters, uh, in archives in different places that uh, we need to unearth and put together to tell the story. There are five deliverables, two of which were, will be in the um, uh, core interest of the uh, CPA historical focus research on the nine uh, on the 12 sites written descriptions of them uh, and then translations of those description descriptions into material that can be on a website that people will be able to have access to um, in addition uh, with volunteer work we plan to engage the public and expand the number of people who are working on this project and uh, and of course there'll be some fundraising involved there's a third stage of the project, which I, uh, I'm sorry to say, probably won't involve CPA funding, uh, which is um, putting the signs, working with the conservation team. Uh, this is uh, luckily all on con mostly on conservation land, and so we'll be working with in collaboration with them um, around actually implementing. But that'll be stage three. So while this is a historical proposal to the CPA. 
um, in the context of the other fundraising that we'll do to engage the public, this will enable all of Amherst to learn more about this unique history uh, that's so different from what a lot of people think about Amherst history in terms of the uh, native indigenous, native people's uh, life there, uh, immigrants and uh, the many different uh, factories and mills that were along the river. Uh, by the way, the church that we just, you were just talking about is one of the sites uh, that we'll be uh, reviewing and writing about. So there's a lot of collaboration. I think I'll stop and see if anybody else on our team has anything to add or if we wanna um, move it on to uh, the committee. It seems like I don't see Sam anymore. I'm here. Oh, good. I don't know who's there or not. <laughs> It's like we're in the great beyond. Woohoo! Anyway, I don't have didn't have to comb my hair after all. <laughs> I didn't want everyone to see me drinking my water. So okay. And I had to get up and leave. So uh, I know Jane, Catherine, and Hetty are here. I don't know if they have anything to add. I guess we raise our hands, uh, or if we want to go straight to questions, we're ready to have this conversation with you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Meg. And I I do see. Cat uh, has a hand up, although that may be from before. Um, it was from before because it's removed. So I would like to uh, open up the floor for committee members to ask any questions that they might have. Robin. Okay. Um, hi. hi. Um, I, I just wanted to... Uh... Uh, say, I guess it's more of a comment than a question or maybe a little bit of both. Um, research that you're doing on the additional sites, um, it dovetails nicely with the current objective of the Historical Commission, which is to improve our inventory in uh, the MACRS database. So um, we would love to coordinate on that so that any form Bs that need to be created hmm. are updated. Um, that we could uh, at least get that information and um, make that connection so that that uh, information can do double duty. So um, really in support of this project. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, any questions from other committee members? Katie. <clears throat> Thanks, Sam. And I apologize, I've lost my voice. So if you can't understand me, I would understand that. Um, <clears throat> uh, Meg and Jane, Kat and Hetty, thank you so much for this. It's really exciting what you've done so far and what you've found and it's really interesting. I just had one clarifying question. Um, you talk about written descriptions that can be used on a website and throughout the application, you you refer to the, a, a website and you know sort of the QR code idea, but just, uh, just to be clear, the amount of funding that you're asking for now is to do the research, the descriptions, the trans, you know, um, the translation into materials, but not the actual website. Correct. The website, we don't think fits into your criteria. Okay. Just, but that, it, I just, I but wanted to be you, sure. But the fact that we're planning to do it makes our project, you know, more interesting because you, unlike some historical projects that are done and it's preserved and that's terrific, we're going to actually have a mass uh, energetic outreach to the public so people know about it there's no point in doing this if people don't learn yeah Always use pass. use it and, and engage with it right and I just walk, wanted to be walk clear. and enjoy the nature and the river and so on yeah so okay so that would be under a separate fundraising right um, process that you would undertake um and we haven't with, done we haven't figured out people say oh get a volunteer to do the website and we've all had mixed feel, mixed experiences with volunteers taking on. Big, so we're, we haven't figured that out yet, but that's exactly right. That's not part of what the funding we're seeking. And that would be kind of maybe phase two B, you know, before you get to phase three. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Does anybody else on our committee want to add to that? Maybe that was enough. I think that's accurate. This is Jane Wald. I think that's accurate. Thank you. Uh, Matt. 
Yeah, I don't really have a question. I just more have more of a comment that when my wife read about this in the paper, she was very excited. And uh, I also am impressed with sort of the range of different um, historical things you're covering in this trail. Like you could go on a two hour walk and you could cover everything from, you know, historical architecture, all the cultural things, and then the prehistoric and geological things as well. So I, I, I think this is, this is an exciting project. Uh, thank you, Matt. I see that Hedy, you have raised your hand, uh, I assume in response to Matt's comment. Absolutely, Sam. Um, I think it's been our goal from very early on in the thinking and gathering of people and resources about this area of Amherst to kind of think about the layers of history that we wanted to address and share with with our fellow citizens and with other people visiting Amherst um, and to kind of mesh um, the sort of indigenous history with the industrial history with the um, opportunities to see a very beautiful landscape setting, to walk um, and enjoy nature, um, to sort of really try and, I don't know, <laughs> grab it all <laughs> um, at this point and, and also dig deeper into, into the records that exist. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Michelle. Hi, um, we've talked before about uh, content at the Conservation Commission meetings, and I guess I'm just going to make a comment and a plug for um, the signs being on conservation lands, just that maybe there could be some integration of conservation of the river um, in integrated into the signage. Uh, so I did read the responses and the questions, and it looks like maybe conservation department is going to be responsible for long-term maintenance of signs or design of signs or maybe something about it. So just sort of integrating that somehow with, um, you know, the history of the mill in terms of conservation, not just about uh, human history would just be appreciated. And that's just my plug. I'm pausing to see if anybody on our committee wants to respond. I, th I think that's a really interesting idea. We should sit down and think that what that would how that would work. This all of the implementation has to be done in collaboration with the conservation team and including who pays for what and so on. We might be helpful if we're successful in raising money, but that's um, there's significant uh, collaborative conversations that we need to have, just like what you just described, Michelle. Uh, I see, Kat, that you have your hand up. Yes, hi. Just addressing what Michelle said, I think a large part of conservation comes with valuing what you're looking at. So uh, this project will uh, spark that knowledge, that interest, that curiosity, which leads to greater conservation amongst general public. Uh, and I think that would be very valuable. If if there's time, can I just, Kat just spoke. Um, I don't know if you heard, uh, she lives very near the North Amherst, the new library that was built. And she noticed uh, she said that um, when they were digging the foundation, these horseshoes were coming up out of the dirt. And she knew that, I'll, maybe I'll let her explain it, but I don't know if you've heard about the horseshoe project that she's, that's incorporate, we're incorporating into this in some, it's a separate project, but she, but where it's incorporated. Yes. I've not heard of it. Okay, the, the the project is called uh, For Want of a Nail, and uh, it was inspired by the horseshoes that I noticed being uh, thrown up from the excavation site behind the North Amherst Library. So I asked Wright Builders if they had any plans for them, and uh, they set aside a few, and I collected a few, and I uh, wanted to put up some kind of memorial or acknowledgement for people to engage with. So there's a local blacksmith, a guy called Eric Dennis, who's come up with a fantastic drawing of a proposed statue, which would be mounted on a plinth. 
exactly on the place where the old blacksmith site was. And currently I'm wending my way through the uh, various levels of uh, town permissions. So I've presented to Paul Bockelman and Guildford Mooring. And this week I spoke with the uh, Public Arts Commission as well. Uh, so that's that's going forward too. And it ties in beautifully with a lot of what's planned for the, uh, the Mill River History Trail. So I'm involved with them as well. It's why I'm on the committee and uh, really uh, in, enjoying the planning stage. Uh, but this little statue hopefully could uh, go up sometime next spring. That would be the ideal. I'm happy to send you a project proposal if anyone wanted to see it. And there's a little website, a little GoDaddy uh, site that I put up for future fundraising for it. And I'd be very happy to share that with you if you wanted. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, <clears throat> uh, can, I guess I have a question or two, um, Meg or whoever. Now, the trail, is it expected? You may have submitted this in your proposal, but I haven't didn't read it in its entirety today. Um, the land where the trail will progress through, uh, how much of the land is public versus private? Um, well, all of it is either public conservation land, except for a stretch along Summer Street where we have to figure, we want to uh, note the factory housing and the uh, lover, the sawmill that was there and the worst immigrants lived. And we have to, we wouldn't uh, have to figure out where we would put a sign in terms of whose property it is. But that's a really good question, Sam. Yeah. But the, it'll be all on the sidewalk. People would walk on, nobody would have to walk across anybody's property. So, um... And, and again, thank you. And I recall when you have uh, come before us in the past, uh, I was uh, impressed with the creativity of your group and the community enthusiasm as I am again. Um, uh, can you, is it reasonable to say that the application, the project, although it's submitted as historic preservation, that there's recreation aspects affiliated with it as well? So that's interesting. Um, I guess so. It's recreation and that people will be walking. Um, it's a complicated subject. And while recreation and conservation are enjoyed by pretty much the same people, they're often in conflict. And if you just walk around Puffer's Pond, you can see that, um, where people don't want to change the walking trail so that it doesn't go exactly mm -hmm. next. You know, Some of us have suggested moving the walking trail a little further away from the pond. Um, people are horrified because they like to walk really near the edge of the pond, which is uh, makes it hard to preserve the ecosystem. So we could explore that if you'd like. It's a um, I'm not I don't know. We'd be happy to explore it. It's complicated. Thank you. Well, walking sounds like recreational activity. Maybe. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the I'm not sure what the point would be if we wanted to get. I know recreation is one of your areas of focus. Um, get the recreation committee enthusiastic about this. I'm not sure what that would. I'm overcome. not certain if we have to distinguish between the categories of funding we've I had. See. I know uh -huh. that recreation and open space go together. Yeah. I'm not sure how that would work with historic preservation and recreation. Uh, well, we can I talk about probably that. Shake her head. Uh, We're all, we all like recreation. <laughs> how, would you like to comment on? Um, just that it, it has to, when they submit, they have to tell us which category that they are submitting in. Um, it, I mean, it certainly could be changed before it's approved, but once it's approved, it can't be changed. And it can't right, be Dave? changed. I'm going to have Dave's own comment yeah, as well. Again, we have had projects that have been more than one category but once it's submitted and once it's approved it absolutely cannot change later yeah I, I i don't want to go into great detail tonight but it's an interesting question sam but i i think by definition you know and we could certainly look at the uh, cpa website you know the the overall intent of this is again with a historical focus mm -hmm. so we're not in we're not 
we're not fixing a trail, we're not adding a bridge, we're not putting down any product. This is simply, these are simply signs that go along a conservation trail within a conservation area. And as Meg said, there might be a few places um, uh, along Summer Street or State Street where there may be uh, interpretive plaques near someone's home that might've been a, 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 an important feature historically. But um, I think we need to be a little careful too, because I, I don't think, you know, kind of mixing and matching, I, I don't think this would meet the definition, the CPA definition of recreational spending or conservation spending. That's just my take. Um, the CPA is really pretty specific about use of CPA funds for signs. So it might behoove us all to kind of read up on that between now and, you know, uh, future meetings. Thank you, Holly and Dave. Uh, Tim, I see that your hand is up. Yes. Um, I always like to ask the applicants, and I know, Meg, it might put you in a little uncomfortable position, but as we debate these, all of our projects with the good prospect that we will not have enough money available to fund everything. Uh, the way I read the proposal, you were going to hire uh, two consultants for maybe six months and so on. And if we had to shave some money, say only approving half of the request as opposed to the entire request, would that significantly change this project in your need. Uh, I'd rather have you try to address that question than us hypothesize as we start to maybe uh, uh, pare some some of our requests down. Uh, so I'm pausing in case anybody, uh, we discussed this, we would uh, probably reduce the number of sites. I see, okay. Um, Thank you. It's a Meg. short answer, but um, you know, obviously, we could hope that suddenly we would raise a lot of money, or, but that's immediately what we would have to do. Is uh, anybody no. else who's still? I know we're Jane had to leave. Yeah. I think that's what we we discussed that ahead of time, seeing that <laughs> that that question would be asked. Uh, Doug, go ahead. I mean, we we have to raise an additional chunk of cha big amount of money anyway, but for those other outreach and website and so on components. Thank you, Meg. Uh, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I um, just to clarify for myself, um, I've heard several references to signs and it's my understanding that the money we're talking about this, this evening for this round of funding is not going to purchase any signs. Correct. It's, it's per purely research and collection of material that in some future, you know, uh, when, when future funding shows up, then we might, you know, somebody might be able to pay for some signs. Um, so at the end of spending this money, you have collected a bunch of information, but there's no physical manifestation of any of your work. Is that correct? With this funding, right. So okay. with this is not going to, as far as we understand it, the signs don't qualify for CPA funding. They're not preserving anything. They're just noting it. But the beauty of this project is if the CPA supports it, you fund the research and then we enhance that research by other funds that we raise to let everybody know what we found out. So it's not like, oh, we saved a house and nobody knows it. Or whatever. So this there's a magnifier effect, and we we're fairly optimistic that there are other sources of funding. In fact, Robin has been helpful in suggesting some, and um, uh, you know we're that's part of what we'll do, not with CPA money, but we'll you know look for those some of those other funding sources. We've already got our first individual donation of a thousand. Somebody just gave us a thousand dollars, hardly without even but much of an effort. So we're you know, we're working on it. <laughs> thank you, Meg. And thank you um, for the clarifying question, Doug. Uh, continue, Doug. Yeah, I had a question for Dave, actually. Um, you know, what we're asked for tonight is a step toward a, an ultimate vision of a series of signs and maybe other physical things that need to be maintained. Um, 
And I've heard some talk about the con working with the town and with the conservation commission. And um, you know, I don't know very much about the District One neighborhood organization and whether they are uh, have enough members and and momentum to be able to install and maintain things uh, over a long period of time. But I guess I'm kind of wondering whether if at some point it basically falls to the town to maintain signs that are implemented by the neighborhood association, is the town cognizant of that potentially happening and you know interested in making in stepping up? Um, thanks, Doug. If it's okay, Sam will jump in. Oh, certainly. Oh. Um, and thanks for your earlier question. Yeah, the reason I went to the actual physical signs is we we kind of got into real estate and the Conservation Commission and Michelle chimed in. I realized that this proposal doesn't get us that far. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Meg, does does this next pulse of funding get the website up or not? Um, um, I don't know if it gets it up. It gets a plan to have one. Okay. Maybe um, created. So, so that's that's also a product, uh, an outcome of this work, right. uh, which is not physical per se. But um, to your point, uh, Doug, I think um, realistically, yes. I think when we install signs like this at a recreation area or a conservation area, um, I think realistically, we we need to assume that the future replacement and or maintenance of them would would likely fall to the town. I think we're always open and we can accept charitable donations for a whole range of things, including a trail like this. So we would not be adverse to um, setting up some sort of endowment fund for this. I think to Michelle's earlier point, um, we because it's on because it's proposed to be on conservation land, and I think the commission would would likely be supportive of it with some conservation content. Um, I think um, I think we also are concerned about consistency. We have a number of these uh, different generations of trail signs around town, and when I walk around and hike around, sometimes I'm a little frustrated, maybe a little uh, uh, whatever, that that we have so many different generations of signs and, and we might just need to take some of them down and start over. So clearly we, if this moves forward, I'm sure the commission and the staff would work closely with Meg and, and the, the team to come up with an acceptable uh, style and material so that they would be, you know, uh, uh, very robust. Um, so Okay. Right. It's a long, long answer, but yeah, I think we'd have to assume the town would then own them and maintain them in, in over time. Thank you, Dave. Uh, any other comments or questions from committee members? I don't see any. Uh, any final comments for our committee, Meg, from you or your colleagues? Anyone? I'm, I said plenty. <laughs> Anybody else? Cat or Hetty or? I see Hedy's hand is up. I mean, I think I think in terms of what has just been discussed, in an ideal world, there wouldn't be any signs at all for this kind of um, trail and that there could be online resources that would be available to people or other kinds of marketing or PR that would bring people to the area without filling it full of signs i'm i'm with dave you know we have a lot of signs um and and you know you have to make sure that you don't the signs don't detract right. from the nature of the the landscape or the impact that that might have on someone who wants to to find out more about the history of the area or what they can do to listen to birds or um, whatever you know, so I, I think I think that just needs to be said that. Um, well, that's know. why. We, sorry. Yeah. No. Go ahead, Meg. I'm, that's why we want to use the QR code technology so people can, you know, even if it's just a QR code. Uh, one idea, though, is some places you might have a line drawing of what the mill on this site looked like, and some of them were two floors high, but you just can't tell by looking at the foundation. But it could just be a QR code with, you know, for example, high school kids reading something or a link to a website. So when you 
went home, you'd be able to read it. But I think there has to be some way of telling people what they're seeing. Uh, thank you, Meg and Hetty. Uh, we're, we've already run over time, yeah. of course. Um, I, I believe uh, committee has had the opportunity to ask the questions that they, they wished to. I'd like to thank you again for submitting your application, for taking the time to come here and uh, share your presentation and respond to our comments and questions. If we have any additional questions, uh, we will reach out to you via email. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Holly, I do see uh, someone named Michael in the audience. The next presentation, which is the last one scheduled for the evening, is Michael and Kimberly Como. Uh, historic House Move, uh, Westside Historic District. Um, I can see that uh, you've been admitted to the audience, Michael. Um, uh, welcome. I'm hoping that you can hear us. Uh, and I'm not sure if you have anyone that you wish to jo have join you from the audience. Um, I, the floor is yours to communicate with us uh, and uh, just let us, you know, we're here to listen. Thank you. Not able to hear anyone at the moment. It may be a microphone issue. Currently the microphone is muted. Now it's back on. It may be that the microphone isn't uh, engaging. I'm uncertain. We will wait while you seek to navigate. Can you hear um, me now? I can hear you a bit. Can you speak up? Yeah, I'll try to speak as loud as I can. Is this a little better? Uh, the last few words were better. Yeah, All right, we're having a little bit of problem with the computer, but no worry, we'll wait for you. Okay. Where would I put those? No, they can't hear me. Keep going. Okay. All right, we're trying to find a, a headset that might help out. Can you hear me any better? Uh, when you spoke loudly there, we could hear you clearly. All right, I'm going to do some yelling on my end so you can hear me, so everybody in the house will, will hear as well. I am here with my wife, Kimberly, and as you know, we live at 260 Northampton Road, which is known as the West Side Historic District. And our request for funding assistance is to address concerns that we are having with our deteriorating foundation. And this funding would allow us to place our house on a solid foundation and to increase the safety of our house by moving it further away, from potential hazards associated with Route 9, which is also known as Northampton Road. Um, our house was built in the mid 1860s. Over the past 150 years, time and the elements certainly have taken a toll on our foundation. Our foundation consists of a fieldstone base extending four feet above our basement floor, which is topped by two feet of brick. During moderate and heavy rainstorms, we consistently get water flowing through our foundation along our east and south foundation walls. Excuse me. Most of the original material that was uh, filled the voids between our field stones along these walls has certainly washed away over the years with the rain coming in, uh, coming in and out through the basement. And our efforts to fill these voids simply wash out during the next rainstorm. As far as the brick is concerned, the mortar the, between the brick has deteriorated to the point where it turns to powder when we make attempts to remove the mortar for purposes of repointing. So we're not successful with that task at all. In addition, ground movement against our east wall has, has caused our foundation to bow inward in two areas. My wife and I purchased our house 30 years ago. And when we purchased the house, we installed gutters and downspouts and graded our lawn to help divert water, excuse me, surface water away from the foundation. 
These measures did work well to reduce water infiltration, but it certainly has not eliminated that. In our search to find a resolution to our foundation concerns, we have had several conversations with excavators and moving companies. One option that was presented to us was to, repl to replace our foundation is to lift the house high enough over its current location to allow excavation equipment to work under the house. The excavation work under this option would certainly be slower and the work area under the house would be, a limit, would be limited to only 10 feet along our front yard before it would impact the state's newly constructed sidewalk and road. Third, and the most cost-effective option is to lift the house, move it away from its exist existing foundation, and then set the house down on a new foundation at wherever that foundation might be uh, poured. Instead of returning the house to its original location close to the road, it would be placed deeper into our yard um, again, getting away from the road. And in terms of safety, this would help uh, would help the house, um, again, in terms of safety. Over the years, there have been four vehicles that have lost control while traveling along route, uh, Northampton Road and have impacted our property. Three of these vehicles nearly missed hitting the house, and one actually crashed into our house, causing some damage to the foundation. As I mentioned, our house is in need of a new foundation, and with the recent widening, recent widening of Northampton Road, safety is still a concern. Route 9 is now a little, a little more than 10 feet closer to our house than it was before the, or before the construction project occurred, and we weren't that far away from the road before that project took place. That's Pretty much what I have to say based on our uh, our request, and I hope you're able to hear most of what I had presented. Uh, thank you, Michael. We could hear you. You your volume uh, wavers up and down a bit. Uh, so the closer you can get to the microphone, the better. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you for uh, communicating uh, as a follow up to your application to the committee and the attendees. I'd like to open the floor to committee members who wish to ask questions or comments of uh, Michael. Please raise your hand or uh, either with a uh, electronic hand or an actual hand if your camera's on. I'm not seeing any uh, questions from committee members at the moment. Um, Robin, I see your hand is up. Thank you. Um, I was just looking over the answers to the questions, the applicant. Um, and um, I don't, oh, I don't have a direct question or comment. Um, I'm just, um, I'm struggling with a little bit of how to view the repair of the foundation versus moving the house um, from a historic preservation perspective. Um, the CPA money is intended to provide funds for historic preservation, but the public benefit, which we tend to define um, for, for private property as the public view of the house, um, I don't think that it would be that disrupted, but um, there are just aspects to it. I I haven't come across a question like this before, so I have to say um, I'm challenged by it um, in terms of comparing the two options and also the argument around um, the legitimate uh, danger of the road, um, which would also be a legitimate, a legitimate danger for any of the historic houses along that route. So. Um, those are my comments. I'm I'm sorry I don't have something more specific and clarifying to say, but just wanted to add that. Uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, Doug. Yeah, I guess I'd like to follow up to the question we had about the preservation easement, and um, I'm going to ask you straight up or down, yes or no. Um, you know, would you accept a preservation easement on the property? 
if we give you CPA money. This is a pretty common and usual requirement for any entity that CPA gives money to. Yeah, I guess my response to that question is um, I don't have a complete understanding of what a preservation easement uh, or how that easement would um, relate to the the requests that we're making. Um, it, and as I mentioned, um, we, we do need to have foundation work. Ours is, is certainly uh, deteriorating to a point that it, it needs attention. And we're, we're just looking to have the, you know, the, the foundation replaced and we certainly are committed to preserving the historic historic uh, characteristic of our house uh, we, we don't have plans to abolish or remove the house from the district so I, i'm really not sure whether an, an easement is going to align with um our desire for for repair of the house well the well i guess i would say that uh I think I would view the easement as a contract between, or a way of ensuring that when the government gives money to preserve a structure, that the structure is committed to being preserved regardless of who the owner is. So you may be absolutely committed to keeping the property and maintaining its historic uh, character, but the next owner may not. And uh, then the funds that we've invested in the maintenance of that structure are at risk. So this is a way for us to ensure that, uh, you know, we don't take, we don't, we don't waste those funds. So um, I think it would behoove you to be, do a re little research on what those are if you need to talk to town staff about what the requirements typically are. Um, I personally would want to have a pretty clear answer to that question uh, before I uh, seriously entertain your proposal. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, to respond to that, I do have two thoughts and I appreciate the question. The first thought would be I, I would love to get more information as to um, how the easement could uh, pertain to our situation. And in terms of your thought about what might happen if we decided to sell and, and what the next owner might be, just as a little uh, back history, um, as I mentioned, our house was built in the 1860s and the house was built by a relative of my grandfather. I think it might have been uh, one of his uncles. So the house has been in the family for its entire duration. Uh, my wife and I are currently the fourth generation to have either owned or occupied the house. And my two children um, are the fifth generation. And my hope is that the one of them would express interest in the house and keep it in the family. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, Michelle. Um, thanks. I just want to second the you know, statements by Doug and that having an answer to that question, I think would be important in our deliberations. So if, you know, that could be um, related to us at some point soon, that would be great, at least from my perspective. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, Michael, uh, with a couple of in, uh, committee members referencing this, it seems to me that it's uh, uh, in your interest to uh, if you have questions relating to it to confirm with town staff, I do see that Dave Zomack is in the audience. I don't know if you have any comment to add on this topic, Dave, but I'd be glad to, the committee I'm sure would be glad to hear from you. Sure, I think I would recommend that Mike be in touch with one of my staff in the planning department, Nate Malloy is our senior planner. Um, Mike may know Nate. Um, but we can easily get you in touch with Nate, um, who's, yeah, and we should really refer, the, these are, it's really a historic preservation restriction. I've heard easement, but it's really a restriction on the building and could possibly be on part of the land. And it typically has to do with, and it typically restricts um, 
future uh, uh, renova renovations and changes to the exterior of the house. Um, and I think the, the bigger question, and we can get into this more in, in future meetings and perhaps Robin, and, and if we need to have Nate come to one of these meetings, um, thinking about you know what is really the public benefit i think robin and others mentioned this and doug earlier is you know although uh i think we all recognize you know the changes that have happened on route 9 and the foundation um the foundation issues that mike and his family are dealing with you know these are public funds and the question is what is the public benefit of moving this house and and so this is you know, these are always kind of unique ones. We, we've we wrestled with these as a town uh, pretty mightily over the last, you know, seven to 10 years. So um, I think this is going to take some uh, some discussion and maybe bringing in some some further expertise. So those are my quick comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Dave. So it sounds as though, uh, Michael, if you're able to communicate with Nate Malloy, if you have questions related to historic preservation restrictions, which, as Dave referenced, are related to the exterior of the house. Uh, Robin. Yeah, just a very quick question for Dave. Is my understanding correct that the preservation restriction is a requirement when we grant CPA funds under historic preservation? It, it, is, it is a requirement. How long the restriction is, there is some uh, room for interpretation on that. Communities have interpreted the CPA, um, the CPA uh, legislation differently. So there's quite a range. Uh, sometimes it's based on the amount of money that is uh, put toward a project. Sometimes they're in perpetuity. It really is is quite unique. Sometimes they're 30 year restrictions. Uh, but they're, you know, if you look on the CPA website online, you can see that communities have done different things. We've been talking about whether these should all be in perpetuity and and or whether they should run to the state through Mass Historic or whether they should uh, be a local restriction that is overseen, if you will, by the Historical Commission slash town staff. So I think that's more of a conversation. And, and I think, Robin, uh, uh, you've had those conversations with Nate a little bit with the Historical Commission, but I don't want to get us too far down that rabbit hole tonight. Uh, thank yep, you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I just, so just to, having clarified that, then um, we're looking, because the applicant was asked if they would accept a restriction, just clarifying that it is a requirement of the grant. Uh, Thank you for uh, clarifying that again, Robin. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Michael, which relates to the uh, question that was asked about it's have it, whether or not you've explored uh, a fence or a guardrail. Uh, I read your response that you have not with the town uh, DPW and the uh, state expansion of the road and a guardrail being beneficial, uh, notwithstanding uh, what the state has done with the road uh, for your property, would a metal fence, for example, something similar to what's at the Pratt football field up the road, but maybe without the spikes, uh, would a fence of that type offer some protection against vehicles, not vibrations, but against vehicle accidents? From my perspective, it seems as though it would. I'm curious your thoughts on the matter. Yeah, my, my guess is it certainly would, depending on what the, the uh, what the fence was constructed out of. So certainly the more substantial a fence, the, the better protection it would provide. Um, certainly options that I'm open to look uh, looking into. And as I had mentioned in, in my response earlier that um, we didn't have conversations with the town related to that because all the conversations I had with the state said it was um, a state project and the town really wouldn't have mm -hmm. um, much of a, a decision-making factor. And I did contact the, the town at one point and they referred me back to the state. So um, again, I'm, I'm certainly as, as my own, uh, as putting up myself, I'm certainly willing to consider those options, and I, I just have to look and see what type of uh, fencing material would work best. 
thank you, Michael. Uh, I can appreciate the, uh, I assume uh, that it's been a, a challenging year for homes that are on that stretch of road, given the work that's been taking place. Uh, I'm sure that it was challenging for the contractors and the workers, but also for the homeowners. I did grow up on Dana Street. I'm very familiar with the area. Um, in fact, the bus stopped right in front of the house there. Um, another question that I have related to your proposal, um, you reference that it, you know, moving the house uh, is a solution that was suggested to you. I, I do own an old house, old meaning pre-1900, that has water problems and foundation problems that may well be similar uh, to what you have here. And I wrestled with a variety of solutions, uh, just, you know, distinct from um, the application. I did find a solution uh, to address the water, which was an interior cement foundation, uh, not necessarily to support the entire structure, but rather to resolve the issue of water uh, in the basement. Uh, I know the name of an organization who was very effective at doing so, uh, vastly uh, more effective than any form of sump pump or other means of attempting to address uh, a soft or uh, ineffective water barrier or structure. I'd be glad to give you the name of who I used uh, at another time distinct from this. This is not related to your uh, contract, but that solution is an option. And as I read your um, application, it seems to me that that is also a type of solution that might be significantly less uh, involved than moving the entire house, uh, particularly if it's effective. I don't know uh, uh, with clarity <clears throat> how that would be perceived from a historic preservation CPA fund category, which to my understanding, it's the view of the outside of the uh, house that's critical. So uh, I guess it's not a question, it's a comment. I guess the question would be, have you considered uh, addressing the uh, shaky, uh, unsound foundation via a wall from the inside of the house? We looked at different options to do this. We haven't received received any quotes based on that because our focus was um, a foundation replacement. But I certainly would like to take you up on your offer of getting information on the, the um, company that you had dealt with. Uh, I'd be glad to at a later point when we're you know it, 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 not necessarily related to this particular set of deliberations. Uh, and I'd be glad to. Uh, and it, it not doesn't necessarily have to be that particular company. I bring that up to indicate that it's a type of solution that can function. Uh, I would defer to uh, General Historical Commission comments related to the viability, uh, related to the exterior view and public benefit of such a replacement. Um, uh, thank you for listening to my comment, Michael. Um, Questions from committee, I see Doug. Yeah, I guess I'm gonna just make one other comment, which is, uh, it's my understanding that the setting of a house is uh, often considered integral to the historic integrity of the house. Um, so, you know, many old houses are much closer to the road than we build today, at least in a suburban setting. And uh, so moving this house back from the road uh, would probably affect its historic value or integrity. I wondered whether Robin might comment on that. I do see that these, these owners have about four acres, a pretty large yard. And so there's plenty of room to move the house, but I just wonder whether it would actually end up diminishing its historic integrity. Thank you. 
Thank you, Doug. Uh, Robin, I see your hand is up. Yep. Um, moving, it, it, it all depends on the circumstances. I mean, one of the um, it, it, moving houses was, I think, pretty common some time ago. And so like the form B's for the um, in, uh, historic inventory in Massachusetts, you know, they have a checkbox for whether the house has moved or not. So um, I think it depends on where and, and, and for what reason. But it's not a it's not a yes or no answer. <laughs> uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, are there other questions or comments from committee members? Okay. Uh, so, Michael, I'd just like to remind you that there were a couple of questions related to a historic preservation restriction, uh, which is apparently a requirement. So, uh, the committee would welcome a communication from you uh, related to those. Uh, committee member questions, uh, if you wish to re to respond to that uh, before our subsequent meeting next next week. We do have a public meeting, public hearing next week on December 7th, uh, after which we, the after the public comment portion of which we will begin to discuss the general projects and funding and uh, how we will approach these. Uh, I'd like to invite you to communicate any last comment, if you wish, Michael. Uh, it's not required, but I just would like to give you the opportunity. Okay. No, I do want to thank everybody for their time and consideration, and um, I appreciate the information of contacting Nate Malloy. I certainly will get in hold of him within the next couple of days and uh, discuss this a little bit further. And based on the conversation I have with him, I, I certainly will present the response to the committee and um, answer the questions that you had raised. Uh, thank you, Michael. I appreciate your patience. Uh, you were unfortunate to have the last slot in our meeting, and sometimes they run a bit longer than uh, scheduled. Uh, so if we have any additional questions for you, we will email you. Uh, thank you again for joining us and for uh, your interest in application uh, to our committee. Great. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. <clears throat> um, so, Holly, I guess Michael can be uh, moved back to the attendees. Robin, your hand remains up. Do you have an additional question or comment? No, I'm done. Okay. So, uh, ran a little bit longer than we had hoped that seems to be the trend for possibly subsequent cycles. We might allocate 20 minutes to presentations instead of 15. Um, the next item on our agenda is financial updates. Before we do that, uh, I see that a hand is up from Dave uh, Zomack. I'd like to invite Dave to uh, speak. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I'll be very brief because I know you want to get to the financials. I just wanted to let you know that... Um, Town staff have met with um, the folks uh, who live near uh, Kiwanis Park. I, I I know that Ryan uh, Ryan Harb sent in some material from uh, from the community uh, that neighborhood earlier. We had a really productive two hour meeting with uh, representatives of the uh, of, of the association, and we're continuing those conversations. And I'm working with with Ray Harp and our DPW staff. Uh, to really look at some of the concerns that were raised um, and whether any of those can be address, addressed at that site or at uh, or or perhaps looking at alternative sites. So I just wanted the committee to know, and we should hopefully have more information for you a week from tonight. Thanks. Uh, wonderful. Thank you for updating us that on that, Dave. It's certainly important information. Um, so the next item on our agenda is financial update. Uh, Holly? Okay, let's see if I can manage this one tonight. <laughs> so the financials have not changed very much except for right now this one particular line. So we did receive um, information from the state on our state match. We have been promised, um, I believe it was 
just about three hundred and ninety eight thousand dollars um as our fy twenty three match, which just the first payment came in last week. So we received the round one support from the CPA. That was $292,625,000. We should be getting another approximately $105,000. So this has just changed very slightly with the next uh, payment that comes in. Hopefully that will get us to the almost 400,000 mark for our state match and that that will bring everything up just a, a tiny bit more um i believe when we were looking at this last time we had about a 600 741 thousand dollar shortfall um when and if we get the next hundred and five thousand dollars we'll be looking at about a six hundred and twenty thousand dollar shortfall so still estimates Partial payment has been received. The additional payment should hopefully be coming in soon. Um, so that's really all there is on the financial side right now. If anybody has any questions. Uh, uh, John. Uh, uh, didn't Tim have his hand up first? Oh, forgive me, uh, Tim. What? <laughs> it doesn't really matter, but okay, thank you. I had two quick co questions. One, the first is just an observation, Holly, that you dated both of these reports same. This one was dated November 7, as was the last one. I kind of like to use the latest date to know which one is the most current picky point, but if you don't mind. Uh, oh, the, so the one, I'm sorry, the one that was in the packet is dated 1130. What's that? Um, oh, I didn't oh. change it on the top. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm it's sorry. November 30. Got it. Thank yep. you. Um, and then the next that. one is somewhat related to the finances. And that is what happened to the uh, cemetery proposal that was all X'd out during in our packet and we never did, heard a presentation. Is that proposal off the board now or are we going to be considering that? Oh no, I'm sorry. In the in the packet, um, I only included the questions for tonight's proposal. The cemetery proposal was wasn't that last week. Did so we, tonight well, in I'm the packet, losing my memory. We talked about that last week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> last week or the first week, I forget which. Okay, fair enough. No, my yes. My... It's, so what I've been doing with the questions and answers is just trying to give you the questions for the proposals that were going to be hearing tonight so you're not picking through 20 proposals and all the questions and answers so i just asked no, the piece that I didn't I, my my error thank you uh thank you tim uh doug yeah i guess i got a little bit of confusion when holly when you were explaining the state match um so the number 292 that's on there is just what we've received so far so far, that is correct. Yes. Okay. So if I wanted a picture of how it's going to end up <laughs> when we need to make a decision, where do I see that? So when when we start our deliberations, likely next week, I will do probably two iterations of this, one with what's received so far and one with what's we've been promised. Um, okay. We never really change the numbers until the money's in our hand because, you know, we never know what is going to happen. Originally, that estimate there was 275, the same as it is in the next year. Um, so slightly more now, more has been promised. We will do, um, like I said, when we get to the deliberations, I will have an updated number there that we can work off of because we have been promised it. We just don't have it in our hands yet that makes okay. sense. And and can you tell me what that number is? Um, what we've been promised? I mean, you know, I think as I prepare for the conversations, yeah. it's helpful to know, well, are we trying to whittle $700,000 off of all the asks? Or are we only trying to whittle off 500,000? Yeah, so the uh, we've received an email from um, the CPA trust, and I think it was 
398. I'm looking it up real quick here. I think it was 398, 325, right, Sam? Correct. 398, 325. All right. So there's about another 100,000 to come in. So there's, yeah, it's about Here's another 100. Uh, the yeah. year end balance or the, the shortfall is probably 100,000 less than we're seeing here in terms of a target to think about. That's that is correct. Is my still sharing my screen as I'm. That's what she just said about the six hundred. Okay. It was a hundred five thousand difference. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Matt. Yeah. Similarly, are we going to see any changes to the estimate of the assessed local tax, or is 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 that not going to change until the financial year ends in May of next year, June of next year? We do not change that because we will have absolutely no idea how much money we're going to get it until June 30th of 2024, till the very end of the fiscal year. So that remains an estimate throughout the entire year, typically. Um, I, am, I am thinking we may begin to just bump this up by a very small amount every year because we've been keeping the same estimate and it typically does go up a little bit. So... I'm thinking um, of maybe slightly adjusting, you know, adding $100,000 a year or something like that because things will go up. But right now, no, we will not be changing that one. Right, because in the in the document from the, um, the Community Preservation uh, Coalition, uh, it said that the assessed local tax for Amherst, and I don't know which year this was, was $1,390,000. 1,840. So that's kind of different than 1,100,000. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, but that assumes everybody is going to pay their taxes and pay their taxes on time and have them paid before June 30th. And that's an assumption I don't necessarily want to make on behalf of every taxpayer right. in the town of Hammers. So, <laughs> okay. I, for one, I'm glad you're in the position you're in, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any other questions from committee members on the uh, finances? Uh, I have one question, and it doesn't need to be answered this evening. I see your hand, Doug. Um, and just for the purposes of potentialities, um, I know what the current mortgage rates are on a house that they've gone up 30 years to 7.12 or thereabouts. Uh, do we know approximately how much less from, you know, either prime rate, what, what a borrowing rate might be, should we ever decide to go that route? Do we have any indication? My assumption is that it's a bit less given our town status than the, in the bond market than uh, mortgage rates. Is there any indication or could we get an indication related to that, uh, at the onset of our uh, discussions. Yes, yeah, so we, I've been actually uh, working fairly closely with our financial advisor in the last several weeks on some other things going on in the town of Amherst. And so right now they are estimating, I believe uh, between four and 5% for borrowing where we used to be able to use a, you know, closer to three, maybe once in a while a four, but now they're saying probably four to 5%. So borrowing costs certainly, you know, will be and have been going up slightly, but that really is, it's very hard to say. Um, you know, we use what our financial advisor gives us as an estimate, but if a project is delayed and a project, you know, we do borrowing, but they're not gonna build it for two years, it, it it could be higher or lower at that time. So there really are just rough estimates until mm -hmm. the borrowing actually happens. Uh, that's quite helpful. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Doug. Yeah, um, I guess I was just wondering if uh, maybe, I don't know if it's Sam or Holly could talk a little bit about the numbers for or the, the lines that are listed as budgeted reserve and how we decide what to reserve and what to spend and what the considerations are about that. Two different questions. Do you want to describe what a budgeted reserve is, Holly? Okay, so I'll start with that one. So the 
the budgeted reserve. So in FY twenty four's proposals, we did not allocate out every dollar that we had available to us. And basically what would happen is if we didn't set this money aside, it wouldn't be available for us to use in FY24. It would have to roll over into next year's. So there was a there was a proposal on the table um, that we were unsure of. There have been times where a proposal has come in late, an emergency type proposal, something came up and we wanted to allocate out additional money, but we had already given out everything that we had estimated. So in the past, on some occasions, we have chosen to do a reserve. So as of June 30th, 2024, if we have not used that money it automatically just goes back into the pot. But if something else were to come up in FY24 and it was within what we have set aside for a reserve, we could you know, pull together another meeting, make another recommendation, send it to town council and an additional project could be approved. So if we use it on something else, obviously we can't use it towards our FY25 proposals. If we don't use it, then it is going to be available to grant out with our FY25 proposals. As a follow-up, Doug, um, so we set that aside with uncertainty regarding the uh, North Church. It was the dollar amount that was their request from last uh, last year's cycle plus the 5,000 for preservation restriction. We put it in budgeted reserve to retain flexibility for our committee, should we wish to act on that. Uh, in past cycles, uh, there have often been reserves. And when we commence with our deliberations, uh, it's a factor that we consider uh, in what we wish to spend. It, it is available funding for us if we wish to spend it. This cycle, we simply take a vote to move it into fiscal year uh, 25 proposals. Uh, I believe that has to go through Finance Committee and Town Council. I'm not certain, but we've effectively accomplished that in the past when we wished to utilize the reserve that had been set aside. So we just moved it to keep it as a, a possibility for us, flexibility. In terms of the process that we use, how to do that, it's really the committee gets together, talks about the proposals, and uh, we discuss uh, which ones we have interest in funding. And I'll briefly go over that in a moment here. Um, and it's a committee decision, essentially. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Tim, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> uh, again, I don't think we need to talk about this tonight, but we I would like to talk about it before we start our deliberations and understanding how much money we actually have allocated for the use of these projects. Right now, we would be about 700 and some thousand short of our shortfall. Uh, but if you go and look at the debt box, uh, one of the things we've done in past years is taken a big dollar number and decided to use debt to afford that project. I'm real concerned with the Fort River 700,000 coming online in a couple of years. And I think we need to talk about that. Uh, I mean, that's a $700,000 nugget that's not in these numbers right now. So it's something to think about and talk about as we uh, as we proceed. Thank you, Tim. Uh, certainly, we would have that discussion uh, as we commence. And uh, thank you for bringing it up now, as well as prior years. Uh, I certainly appreciate your astuteness related to uh, reading the documents. Um, Can I? The, uh, go ahead, Dave. Zomek. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I may have neglected to say, and probably not the greatest context to add this, but as as I look with our staff, our, our DPW and our uh, recreation staff about pickleball, uh, there is a possibility, a pretty strong possibility that, you know, as we look at alternatives for pickleball, be it on that site somehow or on another site, 
it is very possible that the request that they put in or we put in um, through recreation and DPW will not be enough. So um, you may get an update on, you will get an update on that a week from Thursday. So I, I'll just you, put it out there that it's likely to be more than than that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Holly. I'm sorry, if I may as well. I just wanted to, I just wanted to, I mean, I, I, I appreciate and understand Tib's concerns with the, um, with the debt. Um, but one of the, one of the things that I just sort of want to point out is the nice thing about the debt is that a lot of them are, well, I shouldn't say a lot of them. They're sort of a rolling pattern here. So the Fort River School one has not started yet. That will likely start in um, well, probably won't be till 2026. But if you notice, um, Rolling Green is in its last year and the Kendrick Park Playground. So this is 10 of 10 payments, five of five payments. So these ones would, these two here would be rolling off as new ones. You know, that's sort of how you manage it is you don't take on new things until some of the other ones are ready to. So two of them will be rolling off in FY25. It will be their last payments. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Holly. Uh, as a follow up to that comment, I, I believe it would be helpful to our committee members if we could uh, see a spreadsheet projection going out at least a few years, similar to what we've done in past years, that show the uh, debt obligations. Uh, and I assume that would have to be whatever the, for new projects, the estimated rates that you're talking and for old ones, whatever they were bonded at. Right. Uh, it's helpful uh, as committee members have thoughts similar to the questions that Tim was raising there. Um, so um, what uh, new members, Doug and Bob, who have not sat through our deliberations process um, and for existing members, you know, we will have a public hearing next week and we don't know the extent of public comments that will take place. We will uh, exhaust any requests for public comment. I won't curtail their capacities. We'll let everybody speak. Uh, in past years, it's been the second portion of that meeting where we've had the opportunity to begin deliberations. And the starting point that we utilize is for all of us, and we should all think about this between now and next week, to come up with a number between one and five, representing our favorability or unfavorability of a particular project. Five being very much in favor of it, one being not in favor of it. The, there are questions that uh, arise appropriately so at times uh, in terms of what do we mean by a one and a five? Is it the merits of the project or the budget? It's really your own interpretation of both. If I think the budget, it, I love the project and the budget is fine by me, I might give it a five. If I think the project is good, but I have questions about portions of the budget, I may differentiate it. I know Tim had a project last year. He's like, I give it a five on the merits and a three on the budget. I'm giving it a four. The main thing is that all of us are internally consistent with our own ratings because what we do is we, for each project, everybody gives their rating five, four, three, two, one. We go through them all and that just gives us a general starting point of discussions. It's quite helpful in giving a general understanding and even if one of us has a slightly different internal rating system than the others, um, as long as we are internally consistent to ourselves, it works out uh, in terms of uh, clarity. The, the thing to look at when looking at these projects we've done year over year is within the plan, you'll see the eligi eligibility requirements and the criteria. Those are the inputs along with one's own experience base in the town and uh, uh, favorability or unfavorability for the project uh, that commence with the starting point. We seek to be equivalent and fair to all applicants. All the applications are important to every member. Um, and as we try to do a deliberate process where we don't rush 
our determinations. We allow all our members to discuss thoroughly any of the projects uh, or applications or questions they might have. We go through them uh, with our straw poll rating, not a vote, one to five. Uh, think about them. Uh, then from there, it gives us the opportunity to subsequently give a brief comment as we go through each one, a one or two sentence tops comment so that other members can hear and learn something they might not have from other members. Uh, after we hear from all the different brief, brief comments, such as, I like the project, I don't, I think the budget's too high. That's an example. Uh, once we hear a brief comment from all the members on each project, at that point, members can seek to adjust their straw poll ratings based on anything they might have heard. And that then gives us a template from when we can start comparing to the budget. Last year, it was helpful. The town staff, Sean and Holly, uh, or Sonia actually, were able to um, generate mock-up templates of possible solutions uh, from which we looked at each project. There were many subjects, uh, 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 projects of discussion, such as the Fort River School, which had potential bonding issues. Uh, I don't know how we'll proceed from there, but our starting point is that all of us uh, consider the eligibility requirements, the uh, criteria, and our opinions on the projects and the presentations, uh, come up with a one to five rating, and that gets us going. I do recommend, or I think it would be beneficial for anyone who's unfamiliar to take a look at the deliberations on our videos uh, from last December, December 7th, I think, and the previous year might have been December 8th. You can click on the link. You'll see the big red spreadsheet with, you know, yellow, green, red that reflect the different numbers. The town staff have been very helpful in having adjustments to uh, uh, what the members rate the project. So uh, that's my brief commentary. Uh, it may seem a bit confusing. Uh, and Doug, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to ask, uh, do you have any preferred distribution of one, two, threes, fours, and fives? I mean, you I, it doesn't seem particularly helpful if I showed up with everything's a five because I love them all. Um, if you love them all equally. Uh, That's okay. <laughs> then, then you love them all equally, and that is informative okay. to us. Thank you. Uh, and other members might not, in which case they're their ratings might uh, uh, carry more uh, deltas, but th there's a limit to how detailed we can get on it. Uh, the key is that it's a starting point. It gives us an opportunity to see what others are thinking. Uh, and it might be helpful to just, you know, look at the first half hour of one of our deliberations. And we go from there. Then we start talking the numbers. Tim raised some valid points this year in terms of uh, what's available and what is asked. We faced a significant gap last year as well. Uh, that may be the case for this year and subsequent years, I don't know. But uh, as long as we're all um, internally consistent and seek to treat all the projects and applications equally, uh, then we can have uh, a starting point with good conversations. And it took a long time, two and a half meetings plus. There were a couple of three hour meetings and a uh, uh, you know, the second half of the public hearing last time. I don't know what it will take, but from my posture, uh, I view the applications as so important for those who are submitting them that it's in our interest to allow all our members to discuss and to then uh, deliberate, which is our responsibility, I believe. So uh, I don't have any further agenda items that I didn't anticipate. Um, so again, I'll ask that everyone uh, review the proposals, review the questions that have been asked or any questions. We may or may not receive additional input and arrive at the next meeting ready at some point later in the meeting. And if it goes, if the commentary goes too long, we won't do it. But if we have the opportunity, we may start uh, later half of next week, we'll see. Uh, thank you all for staying on a longer than expected meeting.
um, and I'll see you soon. And thank you to the uh, attendees as well for staying with us and listening. I adjourn the meeting at 8.31 p.m. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Good night.